Tony, everyone, everyone, Tony. Hi. We're going to start with the general storyteller. Certainly. I can't see a thing, but I can hear I your voice. I was going to say, it might be a little dark. <laughs> My background is as a, a film editor. That's how I started, um, doing all kinds of, whether it was uh, documentaries, commercials, features, TV series, dramas, uh, and the like. But I had the great good fortune um, back in 1966 uh, to have met Graham Ferguson totally by chance in New York. I got talking to Graham and it turned out he had just started a film project for Expo 67. And um, it was an experimental film with 11 projectors, 35 millimeter, that all had to be synchronized. You didn't see the 11 screens at once. You saw, saw them on it. The, th the audience moved past the screens. And it was out of the Expo experimental film multi-image craze that IMAX arose. That's when the invention happened right after that. Theaters then were mostly almost flat audience seats. And you looked up at a, a postage stamp on the wall. And IMAX changed all that because of certain designs that had gone into Expo 67 and put the audience much closer to the screen and in this, in this raked position so that every seat was really good. You weren't looking over somebody's shoulder. And on the reason you could do that was because of the bright, clear, very steady picture. The experiential side of, um, of IMAX is absolutely perfectly tailored to, and also the, ad the addition of 3D. Um, to a sub subject matter that I like to direct, um, which is mainly underwater and space. Airless environments, if you will. I don't seem to work any place where you can actually breathe. So I don't really direct them. The thing, that's, that's the short answer. It's the, the wonderful astronauts and cosmonauts that, that, that are there that actually do that on the day. What we do is um, we train, James Nyhouse, my director of photography, uh, and I train them. Uh, we give them about uh, 30 hours of training over several months. Uh, equipping them with everything they need to know to be to make a feature film. In other words, we tell them about lighting, about framing, about moving the camera, about 3D, how to record sound, how to direct each other in scenes. We send them uh, up with a shopping list of scenes, but we also encourage them to vary from that and, and, and create their own things as well as what's on our list. And the classic thing I always say to them is, <clears throat> you know, if an alien comes up and pastes his face on the window, don't not shoot it because it's not on my list. You know, you're the directors up there. You, you know, you're, you go for it. We probably could have got a camera up there to just live on the station, but you couldn't get film back and forth to it. Uh, in a timely fashion. And film gets radiated on orbit um, uh, quite severely if you leave it for more than a couple of months. Um, it can even on the first day, depending on the altitude you're at and what solar activity is going on. So right then and there, the edict was you got to go digital. For the effects on me of digital, uh, it, it was vi a very much old dog, new trick. <laughs> and that's where Technicolor came in because Technicolor, uh, you know, they saved my bacon because they became the official archive source and the keeper of the high res data when it came to throwing out EDLs and doing a complex timeline. Technicolor did all of that and beautifully. We have to provide everything from DCPs to film to specially made uh, dome theater presentations, 2D, 3D. It's sort of all things. And um, without Technicolor's guidance and the coordination that they, you know, that we, that we did with Technicolor and IMAX together technically, uh, we would have hit a lot of stumbling blocks. And they made it go extremely smoothly.